and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn to the Now You See TV studio for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, the seven seraphim of the apocalypse, we're going to be taking a close look and a deep dive into the hierarchy of the satanic kingdom could be a little scary but it's okay because Jesus has made a spoil of them openly at the cross and put them under our feet so get ready it all starts right now because we are now live 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 what's up guys it's so good to be here again and get Mm -hmm. to say those words let us know where you guys are from in the chat or in the comment section if you get to watch this later we're so excited to be presenting the show as David said this is going to be um, something that I think all of you who are really intent on understanding human civilization, all of the civilizations before us, and just where we are at, are at in the whole scheme of things, this is going to be one, especially for you guys, and this is exciting for me as well. Uh, before we get started tonight, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of our sponsors. Uh, we're going to start with Sugar and Spice Soap Company, uh, Natural Soaps, they even have a Midnight Ride brand soap just for you guys and all kinds of other things, too, if that's not your thing. But you can use the code NYSTV to get 10% off any order that you make. And I can promise you this. You don't have to worry about unclean chemicals and unclean any kind of unclean things touching your skin. This is one of the big things for me I, I think that is important in my life is the things that I consume, the things that I put on my body. I like to have them natural and not made by some multi-billion dollar corporation that does not care about my health. So check out Sugar and Spice Soap. Links in the description. Watts Leather. Custom leather pieces, whether it be book covers, gun holsters, straps, belts, bracelets, you name it. Joshua Watts can do it. And he does an awesome job. He's been a long sponsor for us. And he's done a lot of work for you guys out there. Really amazing stuff. Whatever you can think of, this guy can put together for you. So make sure you check that out as well. FOJCRadio.com. Uh, you can check out them. This is David and Donna's uh, ministry for 40-plus years, all condensed into one website where you can check out all their shows, all their books, all their different materials, everything like that, fojcradio.com. Links in the description. Also, nystv.org. That's our website where you can view exclusive content. Uh, for those of you that have listened to us long enough, you've seen us get many, many strikes. You've seen us get uh, demonetized, deplatformed. You've seen it happen to us consistently. This is our way of being able to control our content and actually have good quality content that you can view that will never be taken out of uh, circulation as long as we're allowed to have our website. So please support that. You can use the code uh, RIDER to get $8.99 off your first month. We have uh, exclusive documentaries, Book of Enoch video commentary, just right up your alley. And so check it out. Links are in the descriptions. David, that's all I got for for sponsorships tonight. What do you got? You got anything you want to tell us about? Well, we will be live again tomorrow night on the Underground Church YouTube channel, FOJC. Going to be doing a live stream on the Rage of the Star God, so that'll be there for anyone that cares to join us. Very good. And guaranteed to put bubbles in your soda. Bubble. John's got a show called Cutting Edge, or on Cutting Edge, called it's called Bubbles and Farts in All the Wrong Parts. Now, <laughs> to me, to me, I don't know that that's like the most intriguing thing that I want to hear. But there's a lot of people that really like it, and John's funny, so he's probably it's probably really funny. Like the name alone, though, 
doesn't sound good uh, for me, but you guys might like it and might enjoy it. So make sure you guys yeah, check that out. Yeah, and you guys too. will have a show Sunday also. Yeah, right? Breaking Babylon Sunday. We do that right before your guys' show yeah. every Sunday. So there'll be a lot going on Sunday. Breaking Babylon at six and Underground Church at eight. So keep everybody out of the pool hall. Well, enough of that. Let's get to work. <laughs> Let's do it. Enoch 69. It's Enoch chapter 69. The seven seraphim of the, of the apocalypse. And one of the things, in my opinion, that is grossly undertaught and indeed not taught at all. Put your mic a little closer to your mouth there, David, just a little bit. Kind of bend it in there. There you go. Sorry about that. All right. Is that better? That's much better. All right. In my opinion, one of the things that is undertaught and really not taught at all is the complexity of the satanic kingdom. And most people, the most you'll hear about, well, we've got fallen angels, demons, and of course there's Satan. And that's about all you hear about. But there is tremendous complexity. And in the scripture, Jesus spoke of Satan's kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 12, uh, in verses 25 and 26, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then, how shall then his kingdom stand? And Jesus spoke of the kingdom of Satan as a kingdom that has structure, hierarchy, and of which Satan is at the top. Now, last week, or not last week, but the last Midnight Ride we did, been two weeks ago, where we talked about the 68th chapter of the Book of Enoch, we talked about the horrific judgment that the fallen angels fell under. It was so horrific that even it even horrified the angels that did not fall. We talked about them being boiled in hot metal and water in the heart of the earth. And we're going to get a deeper look as we open up in the 69th chapter of the book of Enoch. It lists those angels that fell under that horrific judgment that were being horrifically punished. And after this judgment, they shall terrify and make them to tremble because they have shown this to those that dwell on the earth. And behold, the names of those angels, and these are their names, the list of them is Samjaza, the second, Artuika, the third, Armin, the fourth, Korkabel, the fifth, Turalet, the sixth, Rumja, the seventh, Danjal, the eighth, Nerquelt, the ninth, Barquel, the tenth, Azazel, the eleventh, Armos, the twelfth, Bartagal, the thirteenth, Basajalt, the fourteenth, Haniel, the fifteenth, Terelt, the sixteenth, Semaseel, the seventeenth, Jatrel, the 18th, Tumiel, and the 19th, Terrell, the 20th, Rumiel, the 21st, Azelt, now, or Azazel. Now, these were the angels that fell under the horrific judgment. 21 of them are listed. They fell under the judgment that was so horrific that it even made the angels that did not fall uh, horrified. And we need a little more of that, John, before we move on. Okay. Good. Now, what we want to look at now in, in verse 3, it says, And these are the chiefs of their angels and their names and their chief ones over hundreds and over fifties and over tens. Now, the book of Enoch in chapter 69, beginning in verse 3, it begins to tell us about the chiefs in the angelic hierarchy that are over these 21 angels that fell under this horrific punishment. So we're peeling back the, the onion a little bit here. Yes, we know that from Scripture that the watchers fell. We know from the book of Enoch that they came down in the days of Jared on Mount Hermon. But now we're seeing even more. We're seeing what transpired with the fallen realm that were the chief ones over these 21. 
And in Ezekiel 38, when it talks about the chief, the angels that were the chiefs over these 21 angels, it's just like in the book of Ezekiel, says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshish and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog is a prince, just like in Daniel 10, the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia, the prince of Rome, and so on. Gog is a satanic prince, and he is a chief over this uh, Meshish and Tubal. This is what we're seeing, the same concept in Enoch 69, that we're going to have unveiled the chiefs over the angels that fell. And we'll understand what transpired and what took place to cause this to come about. Now, what we're going to see, we're going to see in the book of Enoch, five Satans are going to be revealed. And we're going to put that together with two Satans or seraphims from Scripture. And we're going to get the understanding of the seven seraphims of the apocalypse. Now, we'll look here at Enoch chapter 40 in verse 7 and i heard the fourth voice fending off the satans notice that's plural and forbidding them to come before the lord of spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth now that immediately brings a picture to our mind doesn't it we know that satan is the accuser of the saints at before the throne but now in the book of Enoch, we find there are more Satans that function in the very same way that Satan functions. Now, this is a book that was a real life changer for me. I've had this book since the 70s, and uh, it is the, old, the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament in English by R.H. Charles. And it gives me my first glimpse of the book of Enoch decades ago. And on the scripture that we just read in Enoch chapter 40 and verse 7, Brother Charles has a footnote about these Satans, these Satans that are mentioned that come against and accuse the saints before the throne. He says, these are ruled by a chief, Satan, to whom the watchers became subject and so fell. So there's not just one Satan, but there is a whole class of spiritual beings called the Satans. And this is what we see in Scripture spoken of as the seraphim. And the watchers fell and became subject to Satan and the Satans. And he, get, he goes on, he says, they had access into heaven, they tempted to evil. And he references the text in Ezekiel or in Enoch chapter 69 verses 4 and 6 and they accused so we see here a much deeper look into the fallen realm when we found out well you know we all know about Satan but we didn't know about Satan's and in Enoch 53 and 3 this is the order as it's given in the book of Enoch Satan is number one is said, for I saw all the angels of punishment abiding there and preparing all the instruments of Satan. It shows Satan as the leader of this fallen hierarchy in, in Enoch 54 and 6. And Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them on that day into the burning furnace that the Lord of spirits may take vengeance on them for the unrighteous for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. So this is the picture in the book of Enoch. We have Satan, the big guy. We have other Satans. And then we have the watchers that became subject unto them. And in future lessons, we'll get into the details of just exactly the role that these Satans played in tempting the angels to fail. It wasn't just their idea. They didn't come up with the idea of mating with human women on their own, but Satan used these other seraphim, the very highest order in the fallen realm, to entice these angels to cohabitate with human women. Now, we know the scripture here in Revelation 12. 
And there was war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found in heaven any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He wasn't cast out of the earth. But he's cast into the earth, very specific, the way Scripture states it. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our, of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And one of the things that is so heartbreaking, most of the people that profess Christianity they believe that they are taking the strongest punch Satan has to throw right now. But the Bible tells us that he is going to be cast back into the earth. And the scripture in Job, which most of us are familiar with, it gives us the scenario of what took place before the throne of God. Now there was a day when the sons of God came also to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And this is what takes place with Satan as the accuser. He accuses me. He accuses you. He will try to drag our sins out from under the blood. And many people will try to tell you that this has already take place. But it is such an easy thing to prove. And every child of God can prove this by experience. Every born-again believer knows and feels the accusations against Satan. Can I, if you, if you feel that, just raise your hand. What child of God does not have the accuser want to drag their old sins out from under the blood and constantly beat you up over every failure that you've had and tell you you're no good, you're not worthy, and all of this, and we're not, but Christ's blood makes us worthy. Now, that alone proves that the accuser of the brethren is still accusing us before the throne, and he's going to be cast into the earth, and it's going to roll, and it's going to get serious, and his angels are coming back with him. And in Revelation number 9, which we were talking a little bit about last week, we'll see the abyss opened, and there's going to be some little critters come out. And this is going to get real interesting. And it's a shame, just a, such a sad scenario that the modern prophetic scenarios are totally setting people up for a fall. That none of this is anything that's even on the radar screen of hardly anybody that isn't listening to FOJC or Now You See TV. Now in Ephesians 1.20, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That specific phrase in the Greek is used again in Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The same exact Greek phrase that we have in, in Ephesians 1 and 20. This is where the warfare takes place, at the right hand of God. It is still taking place there right now. Satan is accusing you at this very moment. And what we see from the book of Enoch, he has five little helpers that we're going to be learning a lot about. And this is something that can be very, very beneficial to you in your spiritual warfare and in your prayer life because it is a spiritual reality now let's look at this article from the new interpreters of uh, dictionary and let's read the article on seraphim and we're going to be seeing from the canon in the scripture 
that Satan was a seraphim, and we're going to be identifying another seraphim from Scripture, and we're going to be combining that with five seraphim from the book of Enoch to give us seven, the seven seraphim of the apocalypse. Now, this article from the New Interpreter's Dictionary on seraphim, it says, heavenly creatures often called seraphim with six wings and human voices serving as divine attendants in Isaiah's throne room vision, Isaiah 6, 2, 6, and 7. Elsewhere, the Hebrew word designates a serpent. Now, this is where it's going to get real interesting. The word seraphim is used interchangeably with serpent, and it gives two references, Numbers 21, 8 and Isaiah 14, 29. These are both scriptures that we're going to be looking at uh, before we're finished with our study here. Now, we're going to look at a text that we read in a previous Midnight Ride, and then I'm going to read another text that will reinforce this text that we've never read before from a non, another non-canonical source. And this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from the Testament of Amram, who was Moses' father. And it says this, I saw watchers in my vision, a dream vision, and behold, two of them argued about me and said they were engaged in a great quarrel concerning me. I asked them, you, what are you? Thus they answered and said to me, we have been made masters and rule over all the sons of men. And they said to me, which of us do you choose? I raised my eyes and I saw one of them. His looks were frightening like those of a viper, and his garments were multicolored, and he was extremely dark. And afterwards I looked, and behold, by his appearance in his face was like that of an adder, and he was covered together and over his eyes. Now what is, and I never made this association before, but this multicolored appearance of this viper, we have the viper, and we're going to have the viper show up in, in more text. And he was multicolored, and I never associated this before this study with the rainbow. The, the serpent represents the rainbow. There was a movie out uh, called The Serpent and the Rainbow. This was about, we've talked about this before, it was about voodoo rituals that actually created zombies and brought them back to life with uh with a zombie powder and the serpent is representative of this rainbow and it is a bridge in many aspects and many ways of thinking and it repeatedly is connected uh with the viper in these non-canonical texts now here's another very interesting text here and it's in the testament of abraham which is another non-canonical book and in the uh, 17th chapter, and this is found in the 14th verse, it talks again about these uh, serpentine qualities of these fallen entities. And he showed Abraham seven fiery heads of dragons and 14 faces, one of most brilliantly burning fire and great ferocity and a dark face and a most gloomy viper's face and a most horrible precipice, and a fiercer face than an asp's, and a face of a frightening lion, and a face of a horned serpent, and of a cobra. Now, in the footnote of this book, which was translated by uh, James Charlesworth, it says that the Greek word in this text that is being translated is the basilisk. And the basilisk is a very, very interesting little critter indeed. Now, this is a book called The Grand Medieval Bestiary, and these bestiaries are books about beasts. And this one comes from the 1300s, and they're basically just beautifully drawn art pictures of uh, animals and the explanation about the animals. Now, in this one, 
it's very interesting, and I've got two of them here I'm going to look at. And in these old bestiaries, it talked about the basilisk just like it was a real creature. You know, and the Bible talks about the basilisk, and it's also uh, referred to as the cockatrice. And it refers to this creature as a real entity. So I'm kind of uh, um, believing that the basilisk is real. And I believe they're still around, and I believe we're going to see some more of these before it's over. Now, it says in this bestiary about the basilisk, it says that it was born of the confluence of two traditionally opposed worlds, the earth and the heaven, with the front of a chicken and the tail of a reptile as seen in the bestiary of the transitional version in St. Petersburg. This unnatural birth reconciling two animal realms seen as polar opposites. Now what we have here is something that's unnatural. God did not create the basilisk, but the basilisk is a chimera. The, the scripture has a lot to say about not mixing kinds of animals, doesn't it? And we see here in the basilisk a hybrid, a chimera. And I believe that this was a purposely genetically modified creature by Satan. And I think it has played a huge role in the past, and I think it's going to play a role in the future. Now, this is a very, very creepy picture. It comes from the 1300s, and it's in this bestiary. And this is supposedly Jesus, and it's Jesus standing on top of the basilisk. And it's uh, just one of the many images that come from the Middle Ages and even over that repeatedly showed and uh, showed that their belief that this basilisk was indeed a real creature. You know, David, if I can cut in here, one of well, the things. Cut in all you want, the, absolutely. The one of the things that struck me that, out of all this we were talking about here is this rainbow serpent, on which I know you're going to talk more about. But, um, you know, in our studies about psychedelics and DMT and ayahuasca, this is the entity that almost every single person that takes ayahuasca sees when they enter in this hallucinogenic state yeah. or when they enter into this other realm. Uh, this is also interesting because America, according to Manly P. Hall, was named after the Lamb of the Plume Serpent. And we see this yeah. symbology all over the world showing us that at one time these entities did rule, in fact, rule over the land, it looks like. Absolutely. We're going to be looking before we're done of the Nagas in the Indian lore. And these things were real. And uh, after it's going to be very soon, there's not going to be a lot of people arguing that they're not real because they're going to be showing back up. Now, this is another bestiary. This bestiary here that I'm going to read from. Okay. Well, I tell you what, since that slide's there, uh, we'll, we'll just put this in right here because we're going to develop this. Now, <laughs> this is the throne chair of the Pope. This is where Pope Francis sits in the St. John Lateran Cathedral in Rome. And there on the bottom of his throne, he has the basilisk. Now, might this be a clue for anybody? Uh, I think it might be, and, uh, you know, just like we said, there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a lot more we're going to show you. But uh, there's the little basilisk on the thrones chair of uh, St. Francis at uh, his uh, in the St. John's Lateran Cathedral in Rome. Now, this... Um, I must not have the picture, David. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and read this. You can I, show it up to the camera, though. Okay, this is it. from... Um, this is from another bestiary. This is even older. This is called the uh, M.S. Bodley Manuscript in 764. That's really back there. And there's just some beautiful art in it. And I'll just read a little from what they say about the basilisk. It says the basilisk is half a foot long with white spots. And notice they just talk about these like they're real because they are. 
The basilisk is half a foot long with white spots. He lives in dry places like the scorpion. If he comes to water, he poisons it so that those who drink get hydrophobia and are struck with panic. The hissing snake is the same as the regulus. That means the king. Killing by hissing before he bites or scorches. But the basilisk signifies the devil. <laughs> the basilisk signifies the devil who openly kills the heedless sinner with his venom. It was commonly known that the basilisk what represented the king, the king serpent, which was the devil. So, yeah, let's put one of them on the throne of a religious leader. Now, St. Peter's Church is called a basilica. <laughs> now, you, this is just, you know, you don't even have to read this, really. Where do you think the word basilica comes from? Oh, yeah, it comes from the word basilisk. This can be proven with any dictionary. And uh, right here in this Webster's Third International Dictionary, it says basilica, also from the Latin and the Greek basilisk, basilios, basilisk king. The word basilica comes from the basilisk. And if I could show here, well, and I, I'm not going to hold it up, but in the diagram of what constitutes a basilisk, there's a 666 all over it, all over it, a 666 in the layout of the basilica. Now, let's do this. Let's take our religious leader and let's put a basilisk on the bottom of his throne and let's build churches and let's name it after this demonic serpent that represents the devil. Yeah, that's what we need to do. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. And the basilicas are the best of the best of these uh, cathedrals that the Catholics have, and it comes absolutely from the word basilisk. Now, we've also had this on here before also, and this is the auditorium at Rome. And you can see the snake eyes right here in the, the auditorium, and when the Pope sits and speaks, he's right in the mouth of the snake. So, yeah, let's put a basilisk chimera serpent on our throne chair. Let's call our chur churches basilisk, basilicas, and let's just uh, do this. Let's just have him sit right in the mouth of this serpent. Now, I just appeal to our Catholic friends here. You know, there's nothing veiled here. I mean, this is so out in the open, there's no way that you could go into that auditorium and not know this represents a big, huge snake. There's pictures of this that are just phenomenal. Now, I don't know what more we can do but to openly expose this and just plead with you in the name of Jesus, get out of this. It's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. And when a man can get up there and stand in the mouth of this snake, and the people will go along with it, what could, I mean, is there, there's no limit to what this man could not do in service to Satan, and the masses of the people just go right along with it. This is hypnotic brainwashing of the nth degree. And we see the very same thing in non-Catholic churches. I can't call them Protestants anymore because the Catholics have stopped calling uh, Protestant churches Protestant. They call them non-Catholic because they're not protesting anything anymore, so they don't even need to use the word. But Kenneth Copeland, who a uh, big charismatic leader, one of the King Prosperity Pimps, he had Pope Francis on the big screen, and actually Pope Francis dialed in to be uh, remotely a part of one of Kenneth Copeland's conferences. And Kenneth Copeland went so far as to cut his, to act like he's cutting his wrist and putting his own blood into the communion cup for a communion service. Now, for anybody that can't figure that out, that is rank demonic blasphemy. And when people will just go along with the stuff like the Pope and the snake's mouth, Kenneth Copeland acting like he's putting his own blood in the communion cup. They're set up. They're ready for everything. They are ready to swallow, 
to swallow the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. They're headed for the, for the last go-round. And I tell you what, once again, I plead and I implore you, get out of that demonic mess before it's too late. It's going to destroy you. Absolutely going to destroy you. Yeah. Now in Psalm 91, 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Now let's go to the Septuagint, and let's look at the Septuagint, which I will use as a commentary, and here our friends in the Septuagint sees the basilisk. It says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion, the lion shall prostrate at thy feet, and thou shalt surely put thy feet upon his neck, and the Israelites and that is not right because in the Septuagint that says basilisk but never mind check that in the oh, LXX uh, let me check it yeah and you'll find that that does say basilisk what translation I got that from I thought I got it from the Septuagint but oh well all righty, well, let's go to the next one. Okay, yeah. It should say they also tread upon the ask, asp and basilisk. I must have got the wrong verse there. Okay. So, yeah. And in the Septuagint, in Psalm 91, 13, it, uh, it does say the basilisk. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead, okay, John. Read says, that. Okay. Uh, it says, Thou shalt tread on the asp and basilisk, and thou shalt tra trample on the lion and the dragon. For he has hoped in me, and I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. That's interesting because all of those animals listed there in the LXX are exactly the ones that are on the throne at his feet there. That's exactly right. That's there. exactly that representation. And, um, you know, it's not that hard to figure out. Not that hard to figure out. And at the very least, and the Septuagint, which I would use credibly as a commentary, they certainly believe that the basilisk was a real creature and a real creature to deal with. And they were right about that. And in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is the spiritual authority that is given by Christ to the believers to tread underfoot these creatures. We have to understand that when it talks about treading upon serpents and scorpions, there's more than just a spiritual meaning there. If you look at Revelation chapter 9, serpents and scorpions come out of the abyss when it's opened. And also chimera creatures that are like these, these basilisks. Now here in the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah, in the first half of Isaiah 14, we're all familiar with Isaiah 14, 12, O Lucifer, Son of the morning, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But in the last part of the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah, not nearly as many people are familiar with that. And this deals with the Assyrian. Now, it says in Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 24, The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have proposed, so shall it stand that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him under foot, tread him under foot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. The same language Jesus talked about treading him under foot. This is interesting because in verse 9 we have the Assyrian and we've talked a lot about the Assyrian in past lessons. In Ezekiel 31, it talks about the Assyrian being in the Garden of Eden. In the 10th chapter of Isaiah, it talks about the Assyrian being the destroyer. And in Isaiah 14, 29, we see the Assyrian associated not only with the cockatrice, but with the seraphim. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, referring to the Assyrian. For out of the 
serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice or basilisk, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent, which is the Hebrew word seraphim. So we have a progression here. Uh, if we could, let's go back. Let's look at it just a little more if we can, John. We've got something going on here. We have serpent, cockatrice, seraphim. It starts with the serpent. And as I said before, I believe with all of my heart, it's obvious this cockatrice was not one of the creatures that was created by the Father. But Satan, I believe, genetically modified and blended the chicken and the reptile to come up with the cockatrice. And this will be a vehicle toward providing a body for the seraphim. We've got serpent, cockatrice, seraphim. It's a progression, and I believe that it is a progression of genetic ma manipulation. It's just like what the scripture said of, of Jesus that a body thou hast prepared me, and I believe that Satan is preparing a body and bodies for these entities that are going to be released and are soon going to be amongst us. Now, in Numbers chapter 21 and verse 6, it says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now we see the fiery serpents showing up again in the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers. Now in verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Now that word is seraphim in the Hebrew. Make thee a seraphim and, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now in the ninth verse, and Moses made a serpent of brass. If you look that up in your Strong's Concordance, this is the Hebrew word nakash. So the Lord tells Moses, make a seraphim and put it on a pole. Moses takes a nakash. Moses was not being disobedient, but the serpent, the, the, the crawly snake, is the sign of the seraphim cursed. The seraphim was cursed, and it became a nakash. And this is, shows us in Scripture that not only do we have the, the uh, Assyrian is a seraphim, but also that Satan is also. Now, let's read a little more from our bestiary here, and let's look at this other creature that we keep, see, keep seeing showing up, and that's the viper, and that is the viper. And I'll read here, and this is actually uh, from the, uh, the Bodley Manuscript, and it says here, it says the viper is so called because it gives birth under duress. For when its belly feeds the pangs of birth, its offspring do not await their natural release in good time, but bite through the mother's body and break out, killing the mother. And I'm gonna I'm not gonna read some of this uh, text here because this is a family show, but it actually talks about the way that the viper mates and both the, the, the mother and the, the daddy viper die during the mating ritual. And it goes on to say, St. Ambrose says that the viper is the most evil of all creatures, more cunning than all other serpents. It is overcome by sexual desire and it goes to the seashore and seeks out an eel. Now here again, the viper is associated with the mixing of the species in unnatural ways. It says it hisses to attract the eel, to invite it to its conjugal embrace. The eel does not refuse, but grants the poisonous snake the mating it seeks. And both 
the basilisk and the the viper they are connected with this mingling of the animal genome and there is a picture here of the mating ritual of the viper and i'll hold it up here there are triple sixes all over that and I don't, i'll hold that up to see if you can see it but the triple six is all over this ancient uh medieval drawing of the the mating ritual of the viper there now this is the uh the world book of knowledge and there's a very interesting article here about the viper now this was uh, a set of encyclopedias from 1929 and it talks about uh it says here under the article viper the so-called pit viper found in America is distinguished by a deep pit between the eye and the nostrils, which is connected with the brain by a well-developed nerve. So we've got a, we've got a big dent here uh, between its eye, and it's connected by a huge nerve to the brain. Well, they... They have tried to figure out what this is all about, and it says here in the article, some observers believe that it is the organ of a sixth sense and that man may never hope to understand it because he has no such sense himself. They actually believe that this nerve that is the huge thing between the eye and the brain and the viper is some kind of a spiritual conduit to the spiritual world well my question is i wonder who the little viper is talking to <laughs> you know i wonder who the viper is in communication with could it be possible and indeed it is that these fallen creatures and i believe that uh, we have the basilisk and maybe even the viper that were genetically created by satan and i we're going to look at another entity here a reptile, I believe, could be a genetic corruption. Could it be that these things have a communication device with Satan where he can control them, just like we would have the control in one of the AI scenarios? It certainly is at least possible. Yeah. Well, it looks like that's what happened in Genesis, right? Yeah. Kind of looks like that what happened. And it's just like in the movies where you've got all the little uh, drones go out and they're controlled by headquarters these are like satan's drones and i think literally that we could have these creatures that are going to be all over the place that uh, can be directly controlled by satan now that could just get real real frosty couldn't it now this is a is the tyrannosaurus rex and rex stands for king you know basilisk was called the king lizard the Tyrannosaurus Rex is the king of dinosaurs. This thing was all kinds of nasty. It was huge. Uh, it was huge. It was fast. And it would eat you quickly. And uh, the interesting thing about, well, one of the many interesting things, I don't believe God created that. I believe that this is a genetic modification. And the people that study Tyrannosaurus Rexes, if you read articles about it, there are mysterious holes in the head of the T-Rex. And there are different theories. Some say, well, maybe uh, they breathe fire. They don't know. But I believe that the T-Rex is another example that is a genetically created entity that was able of correct, direct communication and control by Satan. It's interesting looking to those little, the little arms I've always wondered you know, because a lot of times when you see dinosaur tracks, they look like they could be from a bird as well. The tracks on the Paluxy River, they the ones that we cast there, me and my son, they are they look like giant turkey feet, like giant turkey feet. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine this thing with his little arms, those actually, because, you know, chicken wings, they have the little small arms. Uh -huh. If they were to find just the bones without the feathers, man, that would look like that could be a good place for little chicken wing feathers there. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks you you can just see the more you think about it of uh, the the distinct possibility of that being the very thing and we talked also in the past we talked about leviathan and behemoth 
which scripture says were created by God, but then there are non-canonical references about them being separated, that Leviathan and Behemoth were separated. Well, why were they? We don't know, but I think it's very possible and almost even obvious that there was genetic corruption and things that were not natural going on there. And perhaps this is why Leviathan and Behemoth were separated, because this could be the origin of this uh, satanic manipulation of the human genome. And it's, we can see a purpose in it. It was the purpose for being able to have entities Satan could directly control and also to create bodies that these fallen entities could inhabit. Now, you know, oh, interesting, David, an interesting thing to denote here, too, about the Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannus, Tyrannosaurus comes from the word tyrant. Rex in the Latin is, means king. <laughs> so, like, you have, like, a tyrant king. This is what the, the words mean. Interesting. Yeah. We might have a tyrant king coming. And uh, we might see that tyrant king take a seat on the basilisk chair, mightn't we? <laughs> and give us a little speech right out of the serpent's mouth. Yeah, yeah it's... um. It's just amazing. Now, this is man, myth, and magic. This was an encyclopedia of the occult published in the 70s. And it's got an article here about the serpent. And I want to read a little bit here. Uh, it says that, uh, and it talks about, like John said, there's serpent people all over all of the cultures. And it talks about the Nagas. It says, the later Hindu myths of semi-divine beings with serpent bodies called the Nagas. In many folk tales, the Nagas act beneficently, and a female Naga or Nagini may often marry a mortal. And these are pictured, I'll show you a little picture here of this, if you can see it. They're multicolored, kind of like a rainbow, kind of like the the multicolors of the vipers that we keep hearing about. And it says the Nagas were semi-divine beings with serpent bodies. Sometimes they were beneficent, but if they were harmed, they were vengeful and terrible. And these are seen in the Angar Wat Temple in Cambodia. If you've ever studied that, uh, they are just absolutely uh, fearful looking. And here's a couple pictures of the Nagas that uh, John has come up with here for us. And I mean, some of these pictures of the Nagas, they're just absolutely off the hook. But we see the whole thing there, don't we? We have the female serpent and um, the, whole, um, the whole thing is just right there. You can see it right in the symbolism. It really needs no explanation. And that this female Naga or Nagini uh, she would often mate with uh, human men. So we kind of have, we see the sons of God taking the daughters of men. We kind of have the reverse scenario of that here. We have these female Nagini who in the, the Hindu myth would mate with human men. Now, we see the bright colors. We saw them on the pictures. If you look at this uh, drawing, oh, oh boy, look at that bad boy right there. Yeah. Check that bad boy out. That looks something right out of a movie, doesn't it, John? Yeah, man. That's that's uh freaky looking. I can't help but when I see these things, just think of so let me go back to this picture over here. So you know, the hair headdress of the pharaohs are, you know, because I've seen several of the the Nagas, they look like this, but they also have this big kind of serpentile headdress, kind of like the pharaohs. They have their headdress almost looks like a serpent's head. And they have where the place where the third eye. I don't have a picture of the of the Pharaoh's headdress, but it reminds me one hundred percent of this and the idea of the viper with the little space in between its eyes. You know, all of their headdresses had the little space with the with for the like the third eye looking thing and, and they knew all about this before we did, didn't they? Now my you know, <laughs> did did our good Hindu people did they read the Bible? Why does this monster reptile have seven heads? Yeah. You know? It's the beast with seven heads, isn't it? The dragon with seven heads. Well, why do the Hindus know about that? Because there really is a beast with seven heads. Yeah. There really is. And 
this is just unbelievable. And this is at the, the Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia, which is aligned with the ley lines. Graham, Han, Graham Hancock in Heaven's Mirror talks a lot about this temple. There's all kinds. We've talked about the numerical 72. The number 72 is all over this Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia. I mean, that is a bad boy. And you, you see it all there. Notice here right in the middle, we've got a little spiral. We got like a portal, don't we? Yeah. And um, it's all right there for you. And uh, here we see the the symbolism portrayed in the, the Hindu and the Indian people. It gives us the Genesis 6 scenario right down to this beast and the dragon with seven heads. It's all right there. Yeah. Now, this is uh, amazing to me. And uh, I get I say that all the time. I but it is you just can't make this stuff up. But we see a lot about the rainbow now, don't we? The rainbow since Barack Obama uh, lit the White House up has taken on a whole new symbolic meaning. And it, it says here, continuing on here, this is in the Man Myth and Magic Encyclopedia. It says, but in myth and symbol, rainbows are also often considered to be snakes. Rainbows are considered to be snakes. And there are drawings of pictures with the rainbows actually as snakes. There's a lot of them. And it says the concept can be found in ancient Persian myth, in folk tales of Brittany, in Australia, in Australian Aborigine myth. In Australia, the rainbow snake is an especially important deity, a culture hero, and a creator with wide fertility implications. Some of our Australian friends, if you're out there, and I know you're out there, we've got people listening in Australia, you might comment on this because this is a big thing in Australia, the rainbow serpent. There's a whole occult culture around this rainbow serpent that comes from Australia. So we now, we, we go beyond in our serpent rainbow symbology, we've got an actual, the concept of the crossing over. And of course, the rainbow with the, the father, this was the covenant with Noah. And if you remember what the problem arose over, it was genetic corruption, wasn't it? And this was God's covenant with Noah, the symbol that, and when God started over to purify the human and the animal genome by wiping it all out, and of course, Satan's symbol of the rainbow is about corrupting genetics. It's about changing the human form from one thing into another, corrupting it and polluting it. And this is the, the deeper implication where in, in the occult, rainbows and serpents are even represented as identical. Now, for you other old hippies out there, you might remember this. This was a movie that came out in 1970, and Jimi Hendrix did a little uh, a music for it. It was called Rainbow Bridge. And you see the whole concept there. You see the arch, the rainbow. You go through the gateway. Oh, here we are. We're going to take some acid, and we're going to go through the gateway, the rainbow bridge. And it's talking absolutely about the bridge that connects them with that spiritual realm. And this is the whole thing of the serpent. The serpent wants to connect you to that dark spiritual realm. And this is right there in that symbology of the rainbow. Now this is a book entitled Bridge to Light by Rex Hutchins. This is a Masonic book. It's published by the Scottish Rite. Now, we'll get our good Freemasons here. We'll speak to you a little bit. We've talked to, and th these all show up, and they're all, uh, all just together. You have Catholicism. You have Freemasonry. And now you have these apostate non-Catholic churches all coming together in the same little barrel of snakes, pardon the pun. But here we see the same symbology. Well, there we have the river Styx uh, separating our world from the other. You have the rainbow, and here you have the little Swami, uh, you know, doing his little meditation to cross over the rainbow bridge into the other realm. 
You didn't know Freemasonry was about that bridge to light, did you? And what bridge to light is, it's a dumbed-down commentary on morals and dogma. And it's published by the Scottish Rite. And in this book, there's rank blasphemy of the Holy Ghost where it explains the serpent. Of course, it's got to be the serpent, doesn't it? The serpent swallowing its tail with the hexagram inside of it, with the, uh, we, we've used this symbol before, with the kindly face on top and the dark face on the bottom the showing the duality concept. You know, this is just the same thing. It's the rainbow bridge. It's this rainbow imagery, and it's the serpent. It is the serpent that is making this contact with the other world possible for those that reject the true light and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, here we have something that is very fascinating and interesting to me. These are actual drawings. Uh, this one is a cave drawing from Australia, and the other one is from the uh, Wikipedia article, I believe, on the Rainbow Serpent. And we see here again, and this is from Australia, and there's a strong association with the the rainbow serpent, and boy, we even got us little birds back there. That might be Quetikozo, the multicolored serpent. And they got little aprons on, like uh, the Freemasons. They wear their little aprons. And we see from ancient antiquity the serpent connected with the rainbow and with the transporting of people from one realm unto the other. Yeah, this is really pow uh, really powerful myth and um, in the Norse religion as well, they believe that the Rainbow Bridge, they call it Bitfrost, yeah. takes them to the afterlife, Valhalla, or wherever wherever they go, Ragnarok, I guess, no. Asgard. Yeah, Asgard, that's it. And then also the um, shamans believe the Rainbow Bridge as well. Like, there's a lot of different ones, but you know, you know, you name it, but those two definitely tie in together. And the Him Hindu mythology, the shaman mythology, Norse mythology, they're all super connected in, in such a major way. I don't think people realize how connected all these pagan religions are. I know we've done so many different topics on showing the connections of all of the different serpent religions, but it's interesting because out of all of the different religions, I believe that only Christianity, uh, Jew, the Jews, and the Muslims actually believe that the serpent is the bad guy, right? Yeah. The rest of them think the serpent is the good guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the serpent's the good guy. He's like the government. Yeah, We're from the government. We're here to help you. Yeah. And um, I don't think you could find a culture that, you know, we've talked about this serpent uh, symbology and the worship of the serpent in every ancient culture. You couldn't find one where it is not present. And when you dig deeper, there's this rainbow connection that connects the rainbow with the uh, the crossing over into the spiritual realm. And it's the snake. It's the snake that makes that crossing over from one realm to another. It's represented by the rainbow, which also represents genetic corruption. Yeah. Now, this is a new movie. The Rainbow Serpent, Dawn of the New Age, Beyond 2012. Uh, doesn't need much explanation, and they're just like uh, we read in Man, Myth, and Magic that rainbows are associated with the serpent, and there we see that uh, little serpent rainbow right there and uh, the whole thing. So this is a real deal that people on the dark side of things, they understand it, and they understand it very clearly, and it's something that... Uh, we need to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove and figure out, you know, just what these people are doing because this is a huge thing now, obviously, the symbology of this rainbow. This is their flag. They proudly wave as they march toward their final, uh, march toward the final genetic corruption of the human race. Now, this is the magazine that is published by the Scottish Rite Journal. Now, here again, there's a lot of people 
that get involved in Freemasonry not because they're trying to be bad. They're trying to be good on our Catholic friends. They're, they really don't want to worship the devil, and they need to figure this out. And the, why do they call the Masonic right <laughs> magazine the New Age? It's because it's New Age top to bottom. That's why you saw Bridge of the Light, the Masonic book published by uh, the Scottish Rite. They published this book, The Rainbow Bridge. You've got, uh, you got it all there. You've got the, the twin columns, the double-headed eagle. You've got the triangle. You've got it all. The Egyptian um, architecture all over the house of the temple. And in the New Age magazine, and it talks freely about what they believe as the return of the Nordic race and the, the return of the Nordic race and the Aryan civilization sounds just a little bit racist to me, a little bit like, who, who does that bring to mind? Mm -hmm. Who was that other guy that talked about the Aryans and the Nordics? So, yeah, a little laid off, wasn't it? Yeah. And we, we see the whole thing. That you, you just can't miss this stuff. If you, if you really have eyes to see and ears to hear, you just look. The game plan that's going on here, and you see these groups, you you've got the you've got Freemasonry, Catholicism. You've got these uh, apostate non-Catholic churches. They're just all about it, you know. And they're going to run back to kiss the ring of Mother Rome so fast. Don't get in their way; they'll trample you. Uh, they'll run back to Rome so fast to kick, kiss the Pope's ring. And a lot of these uh, big religious leaders, uh, not to mention any names, but one of their initials is Paula White the uh, spiritual advisor to President Trump. So this, uh, I mean, figure it out. It's not that plain. And I don't know what more we could do to just, be, I mean, this is right in your face. This is evil. This is evil. And this is the representation and the symbolic connections we can draw just from looking at just the basic meanings of the word of this satanic hierarchy, these seven seraphims of the apocalypse. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into this, and we're going to be unpacking the deeper meaning and the deeper symbolism that we see here. Uh, it, it's just, you know, it's bad enough to worship the snake, but now the snake, it represents a little more than that. So um, we've got a lot of things coming together here, and we're just going to try to continue to unpack it and I, I just fear for people, I really do, because people that persist in promoting and being a part of these organizations, it's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. And I plead with you in Jesus' name, get out of that mess. It's going to destroy you. And it really all boils down to people not wanting to believe the actual narrative of the Bible because it's very clear in the Bible that the bad guy was the serpent. The serpent came, deceived mankind, robbed them of eternal life, robbed them of their dominion, um, and took dominion himself, tricked the fallen angels, did all of these things that have ruined the world that we live in. Yet there's an upside-down version of this story that God created this world, and it's an evil creation that we shouldn't be in. We're in a prison planet, and Satan... Sneak, snuck in and tried to get us out and tried to show us the path to enlightenment to get us out of here. So you really it comes down to choose this day whom you will serve because ultimately there's two, two stories here that you can either believe one or the other, and all religions stem from either one or the other story. And in in, from what I can tell, most religions stem from one side of the story or the other. That's exactly what it boils down to. Well, David, fantastic show, man. There was a lot of people watching and really enjoyed this show. And I know I did as well. It's really nice to be able to go through the Bible and see these things because most of the time when you're in church and this subject in particular, you you hear the pastor say, well, seraphims are only mentioned one time in the Bible. It's mentioned in Isaiah. But when you look at the the, the beautiful thing about being able to have the Hebrew text in English in, in the King James Version is you have the opportunity to go back and look at the original Hebrew to see what these words mean, and we see all throughout the Bible. It's completely all through there. And not only that, the apocryphal text, it's really nice to be able to tie these things together and also see from a mythological standpoint how all of this ties into all of the other religions and rules of the world. And so with that being said, David, thank you so much. Thank you guys all who listen to. We are so blessed to have you guys as listeners. 
for to support what we do and to really just get this word out there i've seen just su such an amazing amount of growth in the people that are out there that are starting to wake up and people say well revival is not supposed to happen in the end times but i beg to differ because i'm seeing it with my own eyes and it's not a revival where a bunch of people go to one place and you know they raise up their hands and pray or whatever it's not that type of revival it's a revival of people repenting and turning back to the true word of god turning their faith towards the messiah and so for that we're so thankful and you guys are are the ones that have to have helped us do it along with the holy spirit and along with the father uh, and the son being able to help us get through this world in such a dark world and be able to shine a light you guys are are, are so amazing for that so thank you guys so much for that david you want to end us out and say anything else you want to say well as always we just thank each and every one of you for tuning in and listening to the midnight ride and for all of your prayers and supports we could not do what we do without you so until next saturday night 10 p.m central high five and good night everybody from the midnight ride pounders pound hit the like button guys boom boom <laughs> We forgot the boundaries. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up.